If I'm not mistaken, I believe that I forgot to give you something in our last uh, study in Joshua. And that concerns some biographical information about Joshua. We got all wrapped up in looking at the authorship of the book, giving you those different points, showing you how to date from internal composition the authorship of the book. And once we found out that the most likely author would be Joshua, then uh, that had taken so long, I went right on into their battle plan and skipped over anything about Joshua. So I had several things I wanted to say about him as being the author of the book. First of all, he was the commanding general of Israel's army. We'll look at these various passages on the biographical information of Joshua. Exodus 17, 8 to 16. The commanding general of Israel's army. Exodus 17, 8 to 16. This is the first battle that they've had now that they've been out of Egypt. And of course, this was with the roving band of the Amalekites always attempting to withstand Israel from behind and catch the so-called stragglers. And this was their first battle, first pitch battle that they had with the Amalekites. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. This is a place not far from Mount Sinai, which they arrive at in the next two chapters. And so Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And as a result of this, Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Yahweh Nisi, for he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So he starts off here as the commanding general of Israel's army. Then we see him next of all in chapter 24 and verse 13 along with this passage that we just mentioned there as the personal minister and aid to Moses. Exodus 24, 13, 32, 17, Numbers 11, 28. He's a personal minister and aid to Moses. You see, you can learn a thing or two about Joshua before you even get to the book because of these other... Uh, bits of information that were given about Joshua here in the four preceding books before we get to Joshua. Uh, by the way, that passage there in Exodus 17 is the first place where he appears in the Bible. The first place, that is, where Joshua appears in the Bible is Exodus 17. Now we're over in 24 and verse 13. Moses rose up and his minister, Joshua... Not a spiritual minister here. Moses was his own spiritual minister, but just to minister to his physical and carnal needs, to carry things for him or just to do various things, to run errands for him. Joshua is the one doing this. His right-hand man, in other words. Moses uh, went up into the Mount of God. 32.17, same book. Joshua has gone part of the way up the mount with Moses. Moses, on a lone venture, went up to the top of the mount to receive the ten words from the Lord. When he comes back down and meets Joshua, who's part of the way up, they both together hear a noise in the camp. Notice that this time Joshua is still rather, well, he's naive and inexperienced here. 
because he said it sounds like the shout of war down there. Moses said, no, it sounds like the shout of people having a good time. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. It's not the winners or the victors. It's the noise of them that sing, do I hear. So he hears a lot of commotion going on below. And then in Numbers 11, 28. This is the account. Most of these you're probably familiar with now, but I'll just briefly say something about them so you'll know the context. Where Joshua is jealous for Moses' sake on the account of Eldad and Medad getting the spirit and doing a little prophesying outside of the camp because Moses said that he was the great prophet and Joshua fully believed it being his minister he ought to know. But when the spirit came on these 70 and when it came on these leftover two, Eldad and Medad, then Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the young men answered and said, My Lord Moses forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Well, you see, in the New Testament dispensation, we've had the last part of Moses' would God fulfill. Not all the prophets, but he has put his spirit on all of them. Then we see, thirdly, that he was a spiritual and a godly man. Exodus 33, 11. Now, this is interesting because he stays longer to receive more revelation and to receive more of the anointing than even Moses himself does because once Moses leaves the tabernacle, it clearly says that Joshua wanted to remain there. Exodus 33. You see, Moses has been talking now with the Lord here in the tabernacle. Verse 10, all the people, you see, have seen the cloudy pillar come down. So they know that the Lord is on the tent and they're all looking and worshiping. The Lord spake to Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So he decides to stay a little bit longer to receive more. Moses has had enough and Joshua stays for any that spills over. Spiritual principles, friends, I trust you see in all these things that we're saying just about Joshua. Then we see he comes from the tribe of Ephraim, Numbers 13 and verse 8. So he's an Ephraimite. It becomes one of the two important tribes along with what other tribe? Judah in the land of Palestine among the Israelites, the tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Judah. Then we see, next of all, several names are given. He's called Oshia in Numbers 13.8. He's called Jehoshua in Numbers 13.16. He's called Joshua in Numbers 14.6. And then he's called Jesus two places in the New Testament. First of all, Acts 7, and then Hebrews 4. So if you don't have those changed in your Bible, you might want to go over there and change them or check and make sure that you do. Acts 7 and verse 45, Oshia, Jehoshua, Joshua, and now fourthly, Jesus in Acts 7, 45. which also our fathers that came after brought in with Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles, which God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Jesus, of course, is the Greek equivalent to Joshua in the Old Testament. Both of them mean Savior. And, of course, Joshua is one who saved his people in the land, and Jesus, we're told over in Matthew 1, his name shall be Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Then in Hebrews 4 and verse 8, again, they've left us the Greek. 
And it wouldn't be a lot of problem if we didn't already have another Jesus in the Bible. Really it would because when you get over to the New Testament, it's just a shame that they give us things like Eliseus and Elias and Isaiah and all these names. And if you don't know anything, you don't know who he's talking about there when he says Isaiah and Elias and Eliseus. That's uh, Isaiah, Elijah, and Elisha. They're all four found in Luke 4. And then here in Hebrews 4, we've got Jesus, but it should be Joshua. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David or in the Psalms today, after so long a time, Psalm 95, as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So there in Acts 7 and Hebrews 4, both places it should be Joshua rather than Jesus. A sixth point about him was that he was one of the 12 spies. That's Numbers 14.6. Seventhly, he was the recipient of Moses' anointing. We've got several scriptures to look at here. First of all, Numbers 27, 18 through 23. To show you that the anointing on one man can pass to another man, because we just got many verses here that say this very thing of Joshua. And of course, it comes by the means of the laying on of hands that Moses actually could pass his anointing, or it's called over in 1 Kings, the mantle, on to Joshua that followed after him. Or in the case of 1 Kings, or 2 Kings, that is, from Elijah to Elisha. Numbers 27, 18, the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation, and he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Uh, then over in Deuteronomy, we've got several places. First of all, in chapter 1, of Deuteronomy in verse 38. He's the divinely appointed one ahead of time to receive Moses' anointing and consequently to fill Moses' shoes by fulfilling his task, first of all, of taking the people out of Egypt and then secondly, of guiding them into the promised land, a thing Moses was forbidden to do. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Chapter 3, verses 21 through 29. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. And I besought the Lord at, thy, at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward and northward, southward and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, 
For he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. Chapter 31, verses 3 through 8. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee. Thou shalt possess them, and Joshua, he shall go over before thee as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. Then verse 14, same chapter, the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And then down in verse 23, and so he gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge. Be strong and of a good courage, and so forth. Then over in chapter 32, verse 44, along with this, now here's another place where he's called Hoshea rather than Joshua. But notice that Joshua is already beginning to enter into his position that he will occupy by himself after Moses' death because he is entrusted with this song along with Moses. Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hoshea, the son of Nun. So Joshua was given the song along with Moses. And then finally in, Joshua, in uh, Deuteronomy 34, uh, verses 8 and 9, Now this is summing all up that's been said before about Joshua being given a charge. The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, and so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended, and Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Uh, turn over to Acts chapter 6, and you'll see the same thing occurring over here, where part of the spirit and the anointing on the apostles was put on this group of men the very same way here in Acts chapter 6. In other words, the case of Moses and Joshua, along with many other ones in the Old Testament, constituted the precedent for what we have done by the apostles scripturally here in Acts 6. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Then it lists these men, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the, of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So he has a scriptural precedent for laying hands on these men in Acts 6 so that they can carry about some of the chores that no doubt would have been similar to ones Joshua would have been performing 
back in the other passages that we looked at concerning him being the aid, the right-hand man, the minister to Moses. Now in Joshua 3, verse 7 and 4 and verse 14, we have a promise and then a fulfillment of that promise based on the charge that Moses gave to Joshua that if he would be faithful to adhere to all the commandments and to rehearse them in the ears of the people, then God would be with him just as he was with Moses. Joshua 1, 5, he said, there will not be able to be a man stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee, and so forth. Joshua 3, 7, the Lord said unto Joshua, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And he magnifies them by the act of the supernatural passing of the Jordan River here, because that is what comes between Joshua 3, 7 and Joshua 4, 14, where he said, this day I'm going to begin to magnify you. Verse 14 of chapter 4, Then on that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. So he had been adequately prepared. Uh, you might not realize this, but uh, if you know anything now about the chronology of the Exodus and of their sojourn, uh, you can add up real easily. We don't know exactly how old Joshua is here, but he had to be born in Egypt. So he was born a slave. And how long he served down there, we don't know, but for many, many years. Uh, he was down there when Moses was there, in other words. When Moses came in with Aaron, uh, there in Exodus, the end of Exodus 4, and on into Exodus 5 through chapter 10, and they began talking to Pharaoh and putting these plagues on the land of Egypt, Joshua was there, you see, and he heard all these things. Now, we're not told whether Moses knew him at this time. Probably he did, though. Because all of a sudden, in chapter 17 of Exodus, we just see him appearing here, and he's already the commander-in-chief, the general of the whole force of the nation of Israel at that time. So he had been up, but he had been born a slave down there, just like, of course, many of these other people that had been. Like Caleb. Caleb also had been born a slave down there. Moses had been born one. It's just that providence ruled in such a way he escaped the slavery that was due him as a Hebrew. Then uh, another point about Joshua, he was one of the, uh, well, there were three divisions, and he was one of them, who was appointed to be a divider of the land once they got into the promised land. That's Numbers 34, 17. We'll be looking at that later on. He was one wholly dedicated to God. Numbers 32 and 12. And then finally, he was a type of Christ. Hebrews, one, Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11, in leading the Old Testament people into the rest of God. Only a partial rest and only a natural rest, because the writer of Hebrews clearly says there they didn't experience the full rest that God meant for them to have. That's reserved, that was reserved for us. It's just too bad that too many people still don't enter into the rest today. Much worse off than the people in the Old Testament and still haven't entered into their rest. Well, that brings us now to Joshua 6. We said that the first five chapters contain preparation for going in and taking the land and afterward dividing the land. And now we've finished the preparations. The last thing that we have seen is found in the last three verses of chapter 5. We mentioned them last time, but we didn't read these last three verses where Joshua has an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ and Joshua is getting near Jericho himself and the Lord is faithful to comfort him right on the very eve of battle and he's got to go in and take this city and when he sees the fellow of course he says now are you for us or for our adversaries and he said nay 
In other words, he said, I'm not free to one of you. I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. And uh, he does tell Joshua, well, we'll go ahead and read the passage. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, Well, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So this is his last encouragement now before he has to go in and begin to prepare to take Jericho, which is what all of chapter 6 is about. All of Joshua 6 is about the conquest of their first city, now in Palestine proper, and that is this great walled city, Jericho. Now notice what is said of Jericho here in Joshua 6 in verse 1. Remember that Rahab has already given us some information in chapter 2 concerning the fact that everyone's hearts have melted on the basis of hearing the great feats that God has done for his people both in Egypt and the wilderness. And, of course, it went on in chapters 3 and 4 to give us the passing of the Jordan River. So it says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So they are boarded up completely. They just don't know that their fortification there is going to mean nothing before Israel. The whole walls, are, all the walls are going to fall down here. And they thought if they could keep the city closed up tightly enough, then none could, you know, sneak out and give away some secret plan on how to the enter, enter the city, and then they would be ruined. This happened in other battles here in, in the Old Testament. But such was not to be the case with their first battle here. Uh, one thing to remember here with the case of Jericho is don't think again that all three million people are walk, walking around the city. They could never have done that and done it uh, seven times in one day. You've got a select group of the people, the priests. You've got some blowing horns. You've got the ark and some of the people themselves going around the city. But you certainly don't have three million people going around. A lot of times the Bible doesn't uh, specify those things. You just have to, well, if you don't use common sense, just understand some mathematics and know you couldn't fit that many people around the city of this size. It's the same as in the, f the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, where it says that the whole congregation of Israel gathered before the door of the tabernacle. You can't get three million people before the door of the tabernacle. What that means is representatives of the 12 tribes are brought there and then they have to go back to their tribes and tell whatever Moses has told them or explain to them whatever they've seen happen such as the cloud come down there. Now of course if you had a graduated hill behind I guess everyone could go up the hill far enough but that's not always going to be the case. And this of course is one of the critics favorite things to play around with these different things where it talks about all the people marching around Jericho and they say, well, they would trample each other to death if they were to try to do that. So they've got a small group. Now, one thing that Jericho is to be unique as opposed to all the other cities that we're going to see conquered here in the book of Joshua is that it was to be a kind of first fruits unto the Lord. And this is why they're not allowed to take anything at all from the city. Now, several times here in this chapter and later on, there's a warning against taking the accursed thing, such as down in verse 17. And you need to understand that the things, the various goods and silver and gold and brass and so forth that the people were not to take, those aren't cursed goods. When it says the accursed thing, it really means the devoted items which you have in your margin there, but the person would be accursed if he took one of these devoted items. It was to be devoted in the sense that it was a first fruits unto the Lord. Now look in verse 17 here. The city, the city, this is the whole city, the whole city itself wants to be a first fruits. The city shall be accursed 
even it and all that are therein to the Lord? No, it shall be devoted unto the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. There's another we there. Whoever is writing the book is an eyewitness. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. And it's all right to leave it accursed as long as you know there's no curse put upon the items. The curse is put upon someone who takes the items from the city. And of course, this is what Achan does in chapter 7. Lest ye make yourselves accursed, which is another Hebrew word than the one found in verse 17, in the beginning of verse 18. When ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Look over in the last chapter of Leviticus. Now, this is similar to the law of tithing in the Old Testament. The first fruits was to belong to God. And he did it the same way here with their conquest of the land. Not just the tithe of what they might own, but the first fruits of all of their activities, in other words, was to belong to the Lord. And their great activity was conquering the land, and so consequently he required that all the spoil that would come from this city would go into the sanctuary, into the tabernacle, into the Lord's treasury. Leviticus 27, 28. Now notice what it's called here, and it's the exact same Hebrew word as the word accursed thing over there. Notwithstanding no devoted thing, that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed, Every devoted or every accursed In this century, there have been excavations here at Jericho that have brought up conflicting accounts of when this city was taken. The two most famous excavators of Jericho, first of all, was John Garstang, and he excavated in the 1930s and dated the fall of Jericho. Uh, somewhere in the end of the 1400s B.C., which would be right around the time of Joshua. This is what we would believe. But then in the 1950s, uh, Miss Kathleen Kenyon, this was a woman, Miss Kathleen Kenyon, did excavations and said that the city didn't fall until the 13th century. And of course, what, what she's trying to do and what this does for the critics is to push the date of the Exodus a lot later, rather than the 1400s, it pushes it down to the 1200s. And remember, it's the 1200s date for the Exodus that is the critical date, that the critics put for date. And based on 1 Kings 6, 1, of course, that's wrong. We've got to have 480 years before the fourth year of the reign of King Solomon. And of course, we're going to have to go back to the, 15th, the end of the 15th century B.C. in order to reach this. Now, the last two verses in Joshua 6 are, is another passage which is misunderstood sometimes. Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. Now, this is not only a curse, but it's a prophetic one because we see it fulfilled over in 1 Kings chapter 16 the first chapter right before the prophet Elijah comes on the scene. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son he shall set up the gates of it. In other words, he's going to lose these two sons in, in the process of fortifying the city. And so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Now this does not forbid the rebuilding of Jericho, it only forbids the refortification of the city because we're going to see later on right here in the book of Joshua and later on in Judges, they rebuilt the city right over again and lived in the city. And no curse fell on them for that. But they didn't fortify the city, you know, with great bulwarks and great walls there as a means of protection. But in 1 Kings 16, we'll look at that when we get to 1 Kings, and you can remember back to Joshua 6 that Joshua prophesied this that there would be a man that would lay the foundation in his firstborn and he would set up the gates in his youngest son. And this is exactly what happened. 
a very precise and specific prophecy. Now because that is so precise and specific and we see it fulfilled to the letter in 1 Kings uh, 16, then obviously the critics don't like that, so what they want to do is find out now where did they miss it before 1 Kings 16 comes along and what they say is, well, we see Jericho built before 1 Kings 16. And it's not until then, evidently, that this is fulfilled. But it's because they don't understand this is a curse against the refortification of the city rather than a curse against the rebuilding of the city. And its ruins, uh, of course, are still there. Chapters 7 and 8 deal with their next city, and that is the city of Ai. It's pronounced I, not A-I, I guess as most people call it. It's spelled A-I, but it's just pronounced I. It's a diphthong, in other words. And even in English, when you have a diphthong, you've got two vowels together, you don't pronounce it two vowels. If you get an A and an E together, or an E and an I, you just generally, in it, anyway, you get one sound out of it. Not a big point, but that's what took place here. Now, Achan is the one who takes, verse 21, a goodly Babylonish garment. I mean, he took a lot. 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And this is what God said, don't do. These first things belong to me as the kind of first fruits from the conquest that I'm going to give you supernaturally here. See, God promised them that he was going to be with them supernaturally, that he would fight their battle for them. But whenever Achan steps in and disobeys this, guess who suffers? Achan? No, the whole tribe, the whole family of Israel suffers because of this. And of course, they lose, uh, what, 36 men in battle here. And they had just commanded the walls of Jericho to fall down in chapter 6. And in chapter 7, we find them running before their enemies now, and they lose 36 men. That's in verse 5. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his asses, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, and wherefore the name of that place is called unto this day the Valley of Achor. So his whole family suffers as a result of his sin of what? Covetousness. He said, I coveted those things, and he took them. Now, in chapter 8, they're going to go back and take the city, and I've got a little picture of the battle plan drawn here. Remember, their plan is to divide and conquer, and that's what they're doing here. They're going right into the middle of the country and separating the northern kingdoms from the southern kingdoms here. Well, let's read a few verses before we go to this map. Uh, what we end up with are several groups of people. You've got a group of 30,000 and a group of 5,000 going against the city, and of course, again, it appears contradictory. The Lord said unto Joshua, now that they've corrected the sin in the camp, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king, only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for prey unto yourself. So now he says, I'm going to let you have the prey of this city. But you just couldn't take my city. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty men of valor 
and sends them away by night. Now this is one contingency here. You've got 30,000 men that really don't even participate in the battle. They're simply the ambush here. And he commanded them saying, ye shall lie in wait against the city even behind the city. That means would mean on the western side from where they are. Go not very far from the city, but be ye all ready. Okay, here we've got them at Gilgal. First of all, this is where they come over the Jordan River, uh, back in chapter 5, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now that they've taken Jericho, they're no doubt encamped somewhere in this region. You've got Gilgal, Jericho, then this little dot is the city of Ai, and this one the city of Bethel. And what he does, first of all, is sends a troop of men, 30,000 in number, to the south, around to the west side of the city, and they're going to stop right here and be an ambush on the west side of the city. And I and all the people that are with me will approach into the city. Okay, that's this first line here. This is Joshua. It doesn't mean everyone now, but another large group of people, Joshua going to approach right here. In other words, straight on to the city. And it shall come to pass when they come out against us as at the first that we will flee before them. For they will come out after us until we have drawn them from the city. For they will say they flee before us as at the first. Therefore, we will flee before them. So in other words, you've got a decoy is what you're going to do here. Joshua and the main group of the people are going to come to the city, pretend that they're bold, pretend that they're going to fight, but as soon as the men of Ai come out, they're going to turn around and begin to run. And that's where your 30,000 are going to come in. They've got to go in and begin to burn the city. But then what about this, this little era right here? This is another group that breaks off from the main group of Joshua. We'll look down in verse 12. There's no contradiction here. And he took about 5,000 men. Now 30,000 went to the south and located themselves southwest of the city. And he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and I on the west side of the city. Now it's still west, but it's northwest as opposed to southwest. Now what he's afraid of is you see how close Bethel is to I. Bethel's right next to I. What he's afraid of, what he knows is going to happen, if he doesn't have another group of men to stand right in between I and Bethel, then the men of Bethel are going to come out and help the men of Ai, and that's going to destroy his plan. So he goes ahead and sends the 30,000 southwest. They're the ones that are going to ambush the city and burn it. They're going to come themselves and serve as a decoy. And then thirdly, he's going to have this little group of 5,000 go around to the northwest side of Ai, which would place them between Ai and Bethel. And they're going to be able to stop any people from Bethel and coming over to I to help the people. Now, one thing that we're not told here, we don't even have a battle of Bethel. It's implied in the account down in verse 17. But we have nothing told us of this account. <clears throat> That's why I drew this picture so you'll see the importance of these 5,000 men. Evidently, these 5,000 men were able, were able to take the whole city of Bethel themselves. But this is something we're not given. But it does say in verse 17 of chapter 8, And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went not out after Israel, and they left the city open and pursued after Israel. But of course, what we're to understand is that this 5,000 stopped the people from Bethel before they ever got to pursuing after the other Israelites. The Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city, and the ambush, this is the 30,000, rose up quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city and took it and hasted and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon their pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city, 
and that the smoke of the city ascended. Then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. And the other issued out of the city against them, so they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side, some on that side, and they smote them so that they let none of them remain or escape. So this is the battle plan, and they're able to just crush these two cities all in one move together. Verses 30 through 35, we've already looked at. Remember, they are in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 27, verses 1 to 8. These are our two mountains here, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. <clears throat> and what, of course, they do, as I told you before, they're interrupting their battle plans to go fulfill Deuteronomy 27. They're going to start right back up fighting again. So it's after they've taken Ai and after they've taken Bethel, now they've got Jericho, Ai, and Bethel so far, that they're going to go on up here to Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and fulfill what he had told them to do in Deuteronomy 27. Then they come right back down here and they're going to begin fighting some more, which takes us over to chapter 9. Now chapters 9 and 10, of course, are the uh, southern campaign. The first eight chapters deal with the central campaign of taking central Palestine. Chapters 9 and 10 concern the southern campaign. Yes, brother. Yeah. I've heard that too. We don't have any proof in the Bible of that. An angel told someone that. Yeah, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Something had to happen to keep Rahab's house from falling off the wall, in other words, though. That's what initiated people's suspicion about the whole thing. If her house is built on the walls of the city and all of them fell down flat, then what happened to her house then? Because it says all the walls came tumbling down. So one brother that uh, is from Louisiana were told another brother, and this other brother told me. So I've got it fourth hand from an angel. He said from an angel. Now, I'm not vouching for that because that wasn't my revelation, though. Possibility. Pardon? Oh, really? Well, I've not heard that, but I heard it from, from someone else. Okay, chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 deals with the deceit of Gibeon. Gibeon's not on this map, but again, all these cities are together. It's a little city just a little bit west of Bethel. All of you know the account here of the deceit of the Gibeonites? I'll try to tell you in a shortened form what takes place here. The Gibeonites who happen to be Hivites, one of the seven nations that Joshua has been told to completely destroy, they get smart on Israel. And they tell there's no way they can defeat them, and there's no way they can run. So they use subtlety. I mean, that's the devil's chief craft, to use subtlety and deception to deceive people, and that's exactly what he did to Joshua and what he did to all the other leaders in Israel. And so what they do is put on old shoes that are real worn out and get some moldy bread, and they come real humbly before Joshua and tell him this long, sad story about how they've traveled many hundreds of miles from the east, and whenever they left, their bread was hot out of the oven, and their clothes and, and their shoes were nice and new on them, and now they've traveled so far just to come and see this great people that God has done such great things for, They've come to see him now, and they want to make a league with him and join friendship with him. And the key verse here is verse 14 in the whole chapter. The men took of their vittles. They didn't take any. They looked at them and based their judgment on, well, yeah, their bread is a little moldy, so they must be from a long way off. But they asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Deceived by circumstances, friends, deceived by appearances, walking by sight rather than walking by faith and by God's direction. They got tricked here, and of course, they almost got in trouble because all the rest of the Israelites were mad at them for being tricked like that. This was the leader's fault here, Joshua and the other leaders along with him, that they should have sought the Lord and asked him, were these people telling the truth? But they naively just assumed that they were telling the truth. 
Uh, go back to Deuteronomy. I'll show you why they do this. You see, the news of Israel and of her laws, friends, has just spread everywhere at this time. That was manifested, of course, first of all, with the account of Rahab. It's just spread everywhere. And on the basis of Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 and 2, Israel is commanded to destroy these seven nations, Hittites, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And the Gibeonites happened to be Hivites. Gibeon was just a tribe, and these were Hivites here. So they were Hivites. That would put them in this category of Deuteronomy 7, 1, being one of these seven nations to be destroyed. And they know, in other words. See, they know this. And they also know chapter 20 of Deuteronomy. Now, see, they have to know these two portions of Scripture. They wouldn't have come up with this neat plan. Now, remember chapter 20 of Deuteronomy is the chapter of war. It's their laws for warfare because Israel was to be a humane people and offer people peace, first of all. But uh, then they didn't sit around on the peace table for 15 years with their salt limitations talks, strategic arms limitation talks. I don't know if they ever limited arms or limited their talks. They limited their talks rather than limiting their arms there. If they didn't respond to them, then they just destroyed them right away. Uh, verse 10. They didn't have time to sit around the United Nations table. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. Now, this was only cities that did not make up the seven of Deuteronomy 7 1. Now, whenever they came to one of those cities, they had to destroy them. They couldn't offer peace to them. So remember that. And it shall be. If it make thee an answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries to thee, and they shall serve thee. And this is exactly what happens to the Gibeonites. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword but the women and so forth. Verse 15, Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. See, they knew that, and therefore they're going to pose as being part of a city from very far off because they know that if they make peace with Israel, Israel's not going to destroy them. Then it goes on to say in verses 16 and 17, uh, this does not hold true with these seven cities. You say, then why does it work for Gibeon? It's because they swore an oath to them, and they could not go back on that oath. Even though they were part of the Hivites, even though they were part of one of these seven tribes that God said to completely eradicate, because they swore an oath to them, uh, they could not destroy them. Verse 21, The princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water. I mean, that was too hard jobs to do unto all the congregation as the princes had promised them. Verse 27, And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day in the place which he should choose. We'll look at them later on over in Chronicles. We see this same group of people appearing again. They get on Israel's good side. Chapter 10 is the confederation of five kings led by Adonazedek, who is the first king that we have mentioned as being a king of Jerusalem. That's found in verse 1, Adonazedek. Now, he's different than Adonabezek that we see later on. Adonabezek is the one who cut all the, thing, all the thumbs and great toes off of the king. But he's different than Adonazedek, who is king of Jerusalem here. He gathers together along with the kings of Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, band themselves together in a great company of people. We're still down here in the south. This is the way Joshua's going to be going, down this way. Of course, Jerusalem is going to be right down in this area. And they're banding themselves together to fight against Joshua. Now this, I guess, is one, probably the most famous battle in all the Bible. Why? because the sun stood still for Joshua. Verse 12, 
He said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? And so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So this is Israel's greatest battle because you've got an, an unreal astronomical event occurring. The whole earth just stops its rotation right where it is. Now we're going to study that more in creation and all the other views on what happened there. But if we take it literally again, uh, again, people say, you know, that can't happen. You can never stop the Earth's rotation. If you do, you'll have all types of cataclysmic results. That's what it says here, though. Sun didn't go down and the moon didn't move. In other words, the Earth didn't move. They stayed just where they were. Now, I guess you realize you can see the sun and the moon at the same time, late in the afternoon or early in the morning. You can see both of them at the same time. There's no problem with seeing the sun and the moon together. Now, on through the rest of this chapter... He's destroying all the kings of the south. So what we've got here traced on the map for you, in verse 41 is the verse I mentioned last time where they even go as far as Kadesh Barnea. I don't have that here on the map. But they're going in a jig-jag way, if you will, here, and they do go down as far as Kadesh Barnea. Once they finish the end of chapter 10, they end up back here at Gilgal. Now, we don't have any report of that, but we know that's what they do. Once they finish down here, they're going back to Gilgal because this is where their base is for this whole time. Now, all of a sudden, you see, we open up in chapter 11, and we have them all the way up here at Hazor. So chapter 11 constitutes the northern phase, the northern campaign of their conquest. They're all the way up here at Hazor. And this is what's taking place in Joshua 11, fighting at Hazor, uh, Merom, and Sidon three cities that are mentioned. In other words, he's just giving us representative cities of northern Palestine that they are defeating, which takes place in chapter 11. Then chapter 12, we have a summary of all their battles where we find the list of 31 kings defeated. Now remember, this is where we end our first division in Joshua. As far as a general outline goes, the first 12 chapters are the conquest of Canaan. The last 12, chapters 13 to 24, are the organization or the division of the land, the allocation of the land to the 12 tribes. So in the first six verses, we have kings that Moses has defeated. Then verses 7 through 24, kings that Joshua has defeated. Now, beginning with chapter 13, we start a whole new thing here. All the fighting is over with now. We won't see any more fighting, not one more time anywhere in Joshua. And now we're going to have the casting of lots and the division of the land. Okay, first of all, in chapter 13, we just need to briefly go over these. He reviews the inheritance that's already been given to the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, chapter 14, we have Caleb making his request. He says, give me this mountain. Boldly making his request for part of the promised land so that he can possess his possession. And we also see the three groups of people God's going to use in dividing the land. First of all, Joshua then Eliezer, and then representative heads from each of the tribes of Israel. These three groups of people are going to be used in casting the lots and in dividing the land. This is all in chapter 14. Okay, in chapter 15, we actually have the dividing of the land beginning. And the division of the land, friends, is based upon the land given to Judah and the land given to Joseph. They're the first two, or we should say the first three tribes, because Joseph has two tribes, of course, Ephraim and Manasseh. 
These are the first two or the first three tribes giving their, given their land, and all of the rest of the land is built around the land given to these two tribes because of the fact that Judah and Ephraim are the two most important tribes. So all of Joshua 15 is Judah given her land. Chapter 16 is Ephraim. Chapter 17 is Manasseh. Then chapter 18, they move the tabernacle from Gilgal to Shiloh, set it up where it stays for the next 300 years, and we have Benjamin's land. Mostly a lot of place names here is why we're not going to read these. Chapter 19, we have the following tribes given. Simeon, chapter 19, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. Chapter 20, we have all six cities of refuge mentioned. Three had already been appointed by Moses back in Deuteronomy 4. Three more in Western Palestine now are appointed by Joshua. Chapter 21, we have the 48 cities given to the Levites and 13 cities to the priests. Remember, they occupied no land, but they were given priestly or Levitical cities. 48 for the Levites in general, 13 for the priests. Chapter 22 is the controversial altar that is built by the two and a half tribes. And then chapters 23 and 24, we have Joshua's farewell. More material here in the, these last few chapters than in all of the allocation of the land. But that's all we're going to do there in Joshua because uh, I've got to get on to Judges here next time. There's some other things I wanted to say, but we're going to skip over those because they really need to be covered in another class rather than Old Testament introduction. I always, I always have much more than I ever give. I, I hope you realize that. We always have more than we give, but as we go along, we just start dropping things. As the clock goes around, I cut more and more things out. You always get more at the beginning than you get at the end. But anyway, we're always supposed to know more than we give you anyway. I mean, if I ran out of material up here, then what would I do? <laughs> we won't ever do that, though. <laughs> and I gave you the last two, 23 and 24, his farewell. He dies, Eliezer dies, and then we open to the dark period of the judges, which we'll begin looking at next time. Yes, sir. Not any particular reason, no. Just like there's no particular reason there's 48 Levitical cities or even why there's six uh, cities of refuge, just what was chosen. Garstang, G-A-R-S-T-A-N-G, John. And Miss Kathleen Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N. He was in the 30s and she was in the 50s. For a complete